Okay, let's talk audiences. Audiences are a powerful and sophisticated tool within analytics that lets you create groups of users who meet certain criteria. They can be very broad, like people who have made an in-app purchase in the last 30 days, or very narrow, like Canadians who are fans of yoga and have completed three exercises in a seven-day period, but haven't yet signed up for my premium service. And you can then use these audiences in many different ways. You can filter all your analytics reports and dashboards against a specific audience in case you wanted to see, for instance, how your spenders behave compared to the rest of your users. You can send cloud messages or in-app notifications to a specific audience to make sure you're targeting just those users who are likely to care about your notification without bugging the rest of your users. And you can send different remote config values to certain audiences to deliver a customized experience to just one group of people. And you can target these audiences in remarketing campaigns in Google Ads. Now, if you're a longtime analytics user, you may have noticed that audiences have gotten more powerful over the last year. There are more dials and levers you can adjust, and there are more logical operations you can apply to create some pretty sophisticated rules. Also, we removed one very big limitation from the past. It used to be that once your user joined an audience, they would never leave, which was confusing and often quite limiting. But now we let your users leave an audience once they no longer meet the conditions that put them in this audience in the first place, which is generally how you expect them to behave. Of course, you can, if you still prefer the old behavior, you can do that too, but this dynamic behavior is the new default. Now, there are two limitations you should still be aware of, however. First is that audiences are not retroactive for most Firebase products. When you first create an audience, it will initially be empty when you're trying to use it with products like Remote Config or Firebase Cloud Messaging. So when you create an audience, you'll need to wait for the clients to retrieve that audience definition and then determine whether or not that user belongs to a specific audience. Additionally, if your audience depends on an event being triggered, like making a purchase, you'll need to have that event happen again on the client before the client decides to place that user into an audience. For that reason, I often recommend creating a few audiences you think you're going to need before your app has a lot of users. On the other hand, if you're an app advertiser, you can use these very same audiences right away for things like remarketing campaigns, and they will be pre-populated based on your user's previous behavior. I know this is weird, and the reasoning behind this is a policy issue, not a technical one, and I don't know, maybe this is something we can smooth out in the future. Now, the other important limitation is that audiences that include your user's gender, age, or interests, you know, the data that's supplied for you by Google, can't be used for remote config or notification targeting. They can only be used for building certain ad campaigns like display campaigns or filtering your analytics data. And again, this is more of a policy issue than a technical one, and I don't expect this to go away anytime soon. But let's go over a few concrete examples here so you can see what it's like creating a new audience using analytics. We'll start with a simple sample app, then move on to something a little more sophisticated. Now, in the last couple of videos, we've been looking at this fantastic app where I have a button, a slider, and a switch our users can play with. Each of these UI elements generates their own analytics event. In addition, we've been asking people whether or not they're a dog person or a cat person and setting that value as a user property. So now let's say that one day our marketing department decides that we need to send notifications to all of our dog users who have clicked the button in our app so we can let them know about a great new in-app sale. Let's find out how we can create an audience of just these users. So here I am, back to my sample app on the analytics page. Looks like it's not quite the mega hit I was hoping for, but that's okay. I'm gonna jump into the audiences panel. Now you'll notice that Firebase already has two audiences set up for me all users and purchasers. To create my new audience, I'll click New Audience, and this panel slides over. Down here are a few suggested audiences and templates I could use to kickstart the process. These suggestions might change depending on the app you have and the events you're recording. They're definitely worth checking out if you want to start playing with audiences but aren't quite sure exactly what to build. In my case, though, I know what audience I want, so I'm going to start by asking to create a custom audience. Now I can give my audience a name and a description. And down here is where the real work gets done, selecting which users get to be a part of my audience. In general, I have three categories of things to choose from here. Dimension is basically just another way of saying user properties right now. Uh, metrics tend to be calculated user properties like lifetime value. And then we have events, which are the analytics events that we've generated in our app. So I'm going to select dimensions first. We have a bunch of automatically generated user properties, things like the user's age or OS version and then registered properties. These are the custom user properties that I've created for my app and registered in the Firebase console. And right here is my dog or cat property. So I have a bunch of comparison operators here. Uh, the top ones are for text. These bottom ones tend to be for numbers. So this is text. So I'm going to select exactly matches here. And analytics will helpfully provide me with a bunch of values it's seen in the past. I will select dog person. 
And uh, if I leave this at any point button unchecked, which is the default, then this audience will only include people who are currently dog people and will remove them from the group if they decide to become cat people. Now, if I were to check this, then this would include anybody if they were ever a dog person, even if they change their mind later and become a cat person. Now, for the second part of my audience definition, I'll click the and button here. I'll select events, and down here is my press button event. Now, I can just leave this as is, and analytics will interpret this as the press button event was triggered. And that's actually all I need for this audience. If I wanted to, I could make this explicit, I suppose, by adding a parameter here. Uh, I could select event count. Uh, this is a special event parameter that notes the number of times an event has been triggered. And then I can make this say any value greater than zero. This in any X day period checkbox here shows up when you add event counts. It's basically useful if you want to find users who trigger a certain event multiple times in a certain time period. For example, let's say I was interested in users who were frequent button clickers. If I just left this at like people who click the button five or more times, that wouldn't really get at the audience I'm interested in because even people who just click that button once a month would eventually get included in my frequent button clickers library, you know, after five months. On the other hand, if I make this people who click the button more than four times in a two day period, that sounds a lot more like the audience I'm after. But, uh, you know, let's just revert this back to the more basic form for now. Now, let me call out three other things here. First, you can see here that this conditional scoping option up here tells us that our users have to meet both of these conditions at any point to be included in this audience. This means that a user could click this button and later become a dog person and they would then be added to my audience. If I wanted my audience to only include people who are dog people at the time they click this button, I could change this drop down to within the same event. The second thing you might notice is that I have a membership duration selector here. This basically means that once a person qualifies for an audience, they remain in that audience for a certain amount of time before they basically need to re-qualify for it. So right now, our dog people will stay in this audience for 30 days after they click on a button. If our dog person were to click a button again 15 days later, the countdown basically restarts and they get to stay in this audience for another 30 days after that. This also means that if our dog person decides to become a cat person, they will still remain in our audience for 30 days before they get kicked out. Now you can set this to any value you like up to, I think, 540 days, but if you're planning on using this audience for notifications, you might want to keep this duration to something like 30 or 45 days so that you're not bugging people who stopped using your app a year ago. Finally, over here, you can see analytics is giving me a pretty good estimate of how many people are in this audience based on the last 30 days of data I have for my app. Now remember, my actual audience for most purposes starts off with zero users and grows over time. This thing here is, is basically an estimate. So I'm happy with this basic audience. I'm going to go ahead and click save to save it. Now once this audience fills up with users, I can do things like filter my event counts based on this audience, or target them in Firebase Cloud Messaging, or use them to define conditions in remote config. So those are the basics of audiences. Now, I'd like to introduce you to some more advanced features before we go. And for that, I'm going to head over to a game called Bingo Blast because it probably more closely resembles an app in the real world. Now, this is a bingo type of game that contains a lot of different events. It tracks when players start a game, purchase in-game items, calls bingo, and finishes a round. Now, the round completed event is an interesting one because it contains a lot of data around the type of game they played. Did they play a single player game or a social game? Did they use any power-ups? How many bingos did they get? and what was their final score. So the first thing I'm going to show you is that you can create audiences based on users who have events with specific event parameters that meet a certain criteria. For by finding people who have gotten a score of 40,000 points or more in a round. I would do that by selecting the round completed event, then select add parameter, select the score parameter, and set that to be greater than or equal to 40,000. And if I'm just looking for my expert multiplayer users, I can add another condition so that we're looking for users who have scored more than 40,000 points while also playing the social game. The one thing you can't do here is combine these event parameters with that event count parameter I was talking about earlier. So for instance, I can't say, let's find people who scored 40,000 points three times in the last week. You'll notice that the event count parameter isn't available anymore in this dropdown now that I've selected my score parameter. And if I were to do something like this, this wouldn't work either. I'm basically saying, let's find people who scored 40,000 points and people who have played three games. But those three games don't need to be high scoring ones. These are basically two completely separate conditions. Now, there is kind of a workaround for this, which I'll get to later in the video. For now, though, let's talk about a few other advanced features. One of my favorite new features is the exclude group. As the name suggests, this allows you to remove people from your audience if they meet a certain condition. 
One very common use case for this is if you want to find people who have started a purchase by like visiting your in-app store or adding an item to their cart, but never completed a purchase. In fact, let's create an audience that does exactly that. In Bingo Blast, people make in-app purchases by visiting the shop, selecting an item to start the purchase, and then triggering the in-app purchase event once they complete the payment. So if we want to create an audience of people who can't seem to commit to making a purchase, that's easy to create now with these exclude groups. So I'm just going to create an audience of people who have triggered the store purchase started event, and then I will exclude users who have triggered the in-app purchase event. Notice how I have the option to temporarily exclude users or permanently exclude users. If I were to pick temporary, users would be allowed in the audience once they no longer meet this exclude criteria. I think in general, you're only going to care about this setting if you're excluding users based on dimensions or user properties. You'll notice this doesn't really make a difference in my example since I can't really untrigger an in-app purchase event. These exclude groups are really useful for finding people who maybe need a little nudge or a coupon code to trigger some important conversion event in your app. Things like completing a purchase, sharing the app with their friends, writing a review, or completing your tutorial. Audiences also give me the ability to logically and and or these different conditions together, and they kind of work the way you expect. Like I can create an audience of users who clicked on an ad or made an in-app purchase, or people who are signed into my app and completed the tutorial and are male and signed in and have their device language set to English. You might notice I can perform ands in two different ways, by anding different conditions together here or by adding a completely different condition group. In general, there's not much difference between these two. The difference would be if I want different scoping across these two groups. Like I might want to create an audience of users who start and finish the tutorial in the same session and also people who played both a social and a solo game across different sessions. But you know, that's definitely moving to some advanced features there, so don't worry too much about this. Finally, the last big feature I want to talk about is being able to create an audience based on sequence. Again, as the name suggests, this lets you select groups of users who perform one action and then another in sequence. Now, you can require that these happen in a strict order, or you can allow other events to happen in between these events. And you can specify that these events have to happen within certain time windows of each other. So in Bingo Blast, before your round is over, you have a chance to use a time extender power-up, which is tracked by the Use Time Extender event. Now, I want to find people who use this power-up and then ended the round by getting at least one bingo. That's going to require a sequence of events, so let's build that now. So I can initiate a sequence made up of a series of events by clicking this Add Sequence group. The first step will be triggering the Use Time Extender event. I'll click Add Step, and then the next step here will be hitting the Round Completed event. And then maybe just to make sure I'm including people who found time extenders useful, I'll make sure the bingo's claimed parameter is one or more. Great. Or is it? Now there's an issue here. Right now, this will include anybody who's used a time extender, followed by anybody who triggered this round completed event at any time, right? Whether that's shortly after using the time extender, which really is the group I want, or like completing a round in a totally different game two weeks later. So I can fix that by adjusting how these events appear in the sequence. Right now, you can see this is set to is indirectly followed by. That's basically our way of saying, eh, I don't care what other events happen in the meantime, just as long as the second event happens sometime after the first one. And that could be you know, nothing, or it could be two weeks worth of data. Now, you might think that the way to fix this is to make this direct, which means that the second event has to appear directly after the first one with nothing else in between. But in fact, you can see that if I do this, my estimated user count drops to zero. This is because my app generates a lot of events, including bingo button highlighted, that are bound to appear between these two events, which means that these two events will almost never directly appear one after another. For that reason, I'm not really a fan of using directly follows in these kinds of sequences. I think it's really easy to accidentally break one of these audiences when your analytics team decides to instrument some other event in this time sequence. If they've forgotten about this audience definition, you're going to lose a bunch of users. Instead, let's fix this by adding time constraints instead. Given that our time extenders add only about 30 seconds of time, I think it's safe to say that if you hit this round over event within, say, one minute of this time extender event, then we're talking about events that happened in the same game. So let's go back to my sequence of events, make this indirect again, and then let's say that this second event has to happen within one minute of the previous event. 
And now it looks like I have a group of users who tried a time extender and then completed a game successfully. Probably a good group to target if I were to ever hold a sale on these items. And by the way, this is how I found a workaround for that create an audience of people who have scored three or more high scoring games issue. Basically, I can set up a sequence of events where in each step of the sequence, a user has to trigger a round over event with a high enough score. I repeat that for three steps. And then up here, I can say that the user has to complete this entire sequence in, say, seven days. That'll help me figure out who my real expert players are. So there you have it. Like I said, audiences have gotten quite a bit more powerful over the last year or so. So if you haven't given them a look lately, they're definitely worth revisiting. And hey, if any of this chat around events or user properties has you mystified, make sure you check out some of our other analytics videos in the description below. And hey, why not subscribe to the Firebase channel so you don't miss out on other important and exciting tutorials. And as always, thanks for watching.